Good morning, Dr. Michael Fisher. Just uh, glad to check in with you and check in with uh, the whole political world scene going on right now. Um, I'm going to focus on the Marion Williamson leadership campaign um, in the United States that she's running for leader of the Democratic Party, challenge to Joe Biden, current president, uh, and the possibility of her own victory um, for president. I, I was interested uh, just as I uh, watched an interview the other day, it's co it's common actually, not just the other day, because I've seen it in other interviews where reporters, journalists, right, will get her on for an interview and they'll say to her, uh, so come on, Marianne, you know you're not going to win this. You're not going to beat Biden in his own riding, you know, an incumbent president a seat. You're not going to turn that over. You're, and you're certainly not going to win president of the United States. And and of course, you know, she tries to stay calm. She's ready to explode, I'm sure, inside. Um, it angers her so much, uh, the kind of dismissiveness toward the possibility and what she envisions as possible for anyone seriously who enters the race and the amount of commitment. So her, her response is, was uh, at one point, you know, very clearly she says, oh, I'm going to win. More or less, she said that. I shouldn't quite say it that way, but she says, I'm playing the game so I win. But I think she is going to win because she knows what the game is she's playing, which is not the game necessarily that the rest of the political establishment, what she calls the political machinery, the military, industrial, you know, massive corporate technology complex. But in the sense, what I will speak about today, and I'm going to do a couple different things in this video, but I will speak today about um, there is no winner. Um, not in the place that we are in the world right now. And that's a context that I build. Um, I'm going to show you why I build that context, and I'm going to use a concept called political disability, um, which is related to, and I highly encourage you to watch my video three years ago over more than that, on philosophical disability. We'll get to that. Why am I using those specific terms? Um, why I'm putting this lens on nobody wins anymore. So first thing, let's do a bit of news um, about something that's exciting for me coming up. Um, I'm going to do this short lecture in between in the middle on political disability related to Marion Williamson and the presidential phenomenon the run for campaign that's going on in 2024, um, but I will give a much broader and hopefully more interesting uh, discussion of political disability. And that's just going to be a, me creeping into the topic, just like I did with philosophical disability. I'm just trying to understand something that might be useful to all of us as we talk about philosophy, as we argue about politics and try to theorize and or just win. We don't want to lose, you know, that kind of feeling. I'm trying to bring something in that will mediate that tension of winning and failing, winning and failing, which will breed a cycle of fear, domination, violence, ultimately, in all likelihood. That's why I speak as a fearologist. I am very interested in interrupting that cycle of fear, violence. And then the third part uh, of today's video, um, so it's going to be a bit long. You might want to watch it in a few parts, sessions for yourself. But get a cup of tea, sit down, and the third part um, is going to basically be what are some of the highlights I'm picking up since Marianne Williamson two weeks ago, plus um, threw her hat in to run for this 2024 election. Um, so I've been watching quite a few things and I have a few comments to make. And then there will also be in parts um, recommendations that I'm making to both Marianne Williamson and her team. But I'm actually making them mostly, to be clear, for, because they're not asking for my advice. I'm giving the real treatment in a way, the analysis and treatment that I do um, as an educator, as a someone interested in human development, future of the world. Yeah. I'm really giving my 
recommendations, my cheap advice to the Marion Williamson phenomenon, the phenomenon around, behind, in front of this movement, this energy of what Marion Williamson is just standing for, right? Iconically as an image, uh, just as any other great leader could do and has done in history. Um, so the simple language is that this is not all about Marion Williamson. All right, so uh, let me start uh, with the first agenda, just a bit of quick news. Um, a few things are moving forward for me. Um, the Fearology Institute, which I started in 2018, uh, is going to be getting a reiteration. Um, it went on hiatus for 2020 to 2023 um, for various reasons. It's a my view of an alternative alternative education in the study of fearology or fear studies in which we could actually produce very intelligent human creative beings on this planet to understand the relationship to fear and life, fear and love uh, in much more intricate, up-to-date 21st century ways. That Virology Institute is going to be uh, having a new home thanks to the Apocalypse Institute for Humanities in Connecticut. Um, I'll, I won't go into any more details to say that that's coming on board online. You can check that out on my Fearlessness Movement name and uh, see some of the news on that as it's just beginning. So that gets me into the field of alternative higher education and a new platform, um, thanks to John Coleman, who is the founder of that Apocalypse Institute. Then the other good news is I just uh, made connection with Kevin Barrett, who's the runs his show on Jihad Radio a program, been around for many years. He's a very radical leftist type and uh, interesting thinker beyond just that box. And he's got me on his radio program March 24th, um, around 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so if you want to look up Jihad Radio, Kevin Barrett and myself will be programmed on there March 24th. We're going to be speaking about Marion Williamson and the phenomenon, the campaign. So that will be uh, a live talk. And it's always interesting working with Kevin. I've done a, a one or two, I think, programs with him before short interviews. So I think without further ado, we'll uh, walk into now part of the lecture. And I want to start the lecture with a story. And again, the concept I'm just using, political disability is this largest phrase. And the story uh, begins with a colleague friend I met uh, a couple of years ago, um, Jarrett Kretzel, who runs program called Hand in Hand Nature Education Program uh, here on Vancouver Island in West Coast of Canada. Been running it for several years, very successful program for young children, right? Very young infant toddler up to kindergarten age. Takes them out to the forests and out to the ocean shores and there's this really great, you know, nature connection education going on. Well, when we met, we we had this immediate connection. And so I eventually interviewed him on my Fear Talk series. And so, again, I'm starting my lecture on political disability by this conversation. I rewatched one of our interviews from over a year ago, nearly. And we're in the domain now of child care, which is his work, right? Early childhood development, early childhood education. And that world that these children are going to grow up into, how are we as a society prepping them? How are we as educators, caregivers, child care workers, and so on, supporting young people? So this is how the lecture is beginning, just to keep you track. This is not some fragment that's irrelevant to the idea of philosophical disability and leadership for the 21st century, which Marion Re Williamson represents a very important player. All right, just doing a little glue job there, cut and snip for you. Hopefully that helps to see. So it started with in the conversation um, very briefly, but I want to quote Jarrett in his relationship to his daughter, who was 12 years old. 
in the interview, it came up, and this was not planned per se. Um, he talked about, you know, being pretty early 20s. Uh, he was pretty disturbed by the world um, for a couple different reasons. Won't go into all the details, but eventually he's out on Long Island, where he's from, New York area, Long Island, and he was doing a program for children, young children and youth. Um, and that was a nature program. It's about peace building, cooperative games, all that good stuff, right? And this is like way back, you know, in the the nineties. Uh, well, it's actually just up to the two thousand one because he said he was out there helping train these young people and build this new kind of you know, sense of the world. So he called it peace building. And he says, "Here I am trying to teach peace to kids." And you have these adults creating war 30 minutes down the road from us, end of quote. That war was post 9-11, 9-11 end, sorry. Jarrett was with these young people who were being bused from New York City out to this beautiful peace nature program. 30 miles away and those children on those buses did not know that the towers had been attacked and the impact that that would have in the rest of their life never mind america and much of the rest of the world so it's very pivotal for me as a, a ferologist as an educator how these cultural historical political events can be so profound and there was Jarrett stuck in this period as a young person teaching children. And he got the word, as he said, I was setting up the ropes course and the main manager counselor came out and said, hey, whoa, everybody stop, come in here and look at the TV and took them back from nature into the cultural world of the political world. And they watched the towers and what was going on on the news. That contrast is really important here as I will pursue, again, this possibility of what I'm calling a political disability that may be very important for us to recognize. And so I say us, I'm really talking about all citizens, not just youth care educators and so on. So he just was really struck with that problem of what's happening in the world and he was so disgusted by the end of that um, fall um, he eventually next spring you know decided to go walk the Appalachian Trail get rid of everything kind of walk away from his world walk away from humanity as he says you know I really I think in the interview he says I didn't want to be part of the human race anymore it was embarrassing and I didn't see myself as a human knowing how to walk and be in that world that would make a real any difference than this shameful, embarrassing world, America as well, you know, but not just America. He saw the environmental damage going on, the way we were treating the planet. So again, he's in his early 20s, he walks away, he does this Appalachian Trail, backpacks for the first time in his life and walks a 4,000 plus kilometer trail in six months writes a book about it. I interviewed him about that as well. So he said, yeah, overwhelmed by the problems. And what he felt was, is uh, I didn't feel prepared. I didn't feel prepared to know how to handle that. I didn't know how to feel prepared as a childhood educator, early childhood educator, especially in nature educator, to, to translate what was happening in the world with this disaster to this world that we're trying to build that was a peaceful, loving, caring, great, beautiful world that would come through the connection with nature and you could call it a higher power, higher source of creation itself in the spiritual sense even. It was a very political conflict he was in. That's my point. And it, and it drove him just literally to walk this path and not know anything else what he was doing in his life, but to walk this path with very minimum amount of money, no job at the end, walked away from family everything even though he kept some communication he wasn't you know 
that angry to not want to communicate somewhat with some certain close people and family and friends. But then he says in the interview, one person says, oh, oh, I just want to tell you. So this is like 20 years plus later when we're doing the interview. He's reflecting on that time in his life and I'm pushing and pushing. He just says, I was so sad then. And then he says, oh, by the way, that sadness is still there in me. Again, even though very successful, he's married, he's now got kids, a whole different life. He, you know, everything's kind of really ticking on pretty good for, it, for him. Pretty good, like really excellent from what I can tell. And his daughter, 12 years old, he says, I'm putting her to bed the other night. So here I'll just quote him. Just last night, I'm putting my daughter to sleep. And in our conversation, I don't know how we got there, he says, at one point she turns to me and says, oh, it doesn't matter anyway. We're all going to die anyway. And Jared reflects as a parent, he says, that was really a pivotal moment. And that's what, not just a parent, it's an adult moment of a confrontation with the world existential perspective really from a child 12 years old right teens just starting to think about how they're going to live and be and negotiate a world that makes sense and obviously his daughter again raised in a very stable home really good environment she's done all this nature education for years and years since she was born with these uh, two wonderful parents and so on. You know, no big struggle for her other than she's smart and she's listening and she's picking up stuff. And of course she hears stuff from her parents who are very environmentalists themselves. And so Jared says at one place, he says, how do I protect that statement? Really meaning how do I protect her feelings and my feelings? For what I know, she could be right. And she likely is right, is pretty much what he says. And what am I going to do, he writes, say to her, no, no, no. That's not true. Everything's going to be fine. And he says, I don't know that. And I don't believe, actually, we're going to be fine. To be honest. End of quote. She starts... As he tells the story further, she starts rattling off. There's COVID pandemic is in full force when she declared this experience at night of pretty much a kind of hopelessness. And uh, climate change going on. She's obviously been hearing about that. Greta Thunberg was pretty big in the media a couple of years ago when that this event happened. And then war is also a concern. And the world is just going to blow up. End quote. And he's again trying to figure out how to negotiate as a father with her on this. And he just says, she was so matter of fact about this. This is one of our children speaking. A 12 year old voice. This is where we are at. So I share that story to build a sense again for an argument that there is no winner, right? Whether Marion Williamson wins the presidency or doesn't, or someone does, whether it's the left or the right, the Democrats, the Republicans, and so on and so on, third party, whatever. Same with all activism, as far as I'm concerned. All political sphere. See, I'm going to be dipping into this lecture now. Get my notes here. Bit. We're dipping into the sphere of how we understand the political world, which is an existential world now. Why is it an existential world? What does existential mean to politics? That is a question I am basically arguing ought to be continually asked. What does politics mean? in a world so existentially on the edge. Marion Williamson in her speech after speech after speech is coming out, right, as a, a, a global leader in this 
incredibly powerful, rich nation, so-called, in the first developed world, so-called. And she's saying, we are six inches from the cliff. And she doesn't just mean America. Okay. My audience listening today, I'm sure you know of the kinds of challenges ahead of us, just like this 12-year-old daughter of Jared. There is the problem of, in coming to this, understand this political reality, how well prepared are we to not only announce and enunciate the problem for six inches from the cliff? And that's just you know one phrasing for it. There's many other ways people are saying this. Some people call it the Anthropocene era. Some people call it end of the world. We are entering end times is another way to say it. There's many ways, and these are very dark, right? It's about death and dying decay, and will even the human species as we know it, and much of life, ecosystems around it, continue to exist as we've known it, and as history has known it. And so when you enter such a crisis transitional space as we're in, and that's my point, the very notion of the political has to be re-evaluated, just like the philosophical. There is not the room, there is not the sense or intelligence that's justifiable to claim that we can have an understanding of the political without taking all of that into account. That's the context, right, of the political sphere. So politics itself, which is a much finer, narrower actualization of the political realm dynamics, and it's the environment around that, the whole phenomenon of existence on this world we're playing, Politics itself cannot even begin to get at all of those big issues because it's solving such small issues like winning elections, winning some kind of piece of legislation that gets through, and maybe for a larger cause, but the short-term focus is maintenance and management and getting a few things done. Thank you very much, Pragmatics. And Marion Williamson has to deal with that too. But Marion Williamson also is bringing that we are at the edge I don't think you'll find another politician out there, another leader out there. And I don't even know if she likes to be called a politician yet. Question I would ask her. I don't think she does. But she sees herself as a political leader. Yes. She would say yes. A visionary type of leader. Yes. Wants to be president in the United States. Yes. Wants to be in the political world. Yes. Her view of politician is probably so anathema, so allergic to her uh, because of the way politicians tend to craft and carry out their professions, at least the way she's been watching it and knows of it. So then we get to the issue of adults and children. And here's where philosophical, and now I'm going to call political disability, I am using a theory that basically says adults, whether you're in the political realm, the school system, wherever you are, just even in the home, when you're talking and thinking and sharing around children, information, knowledge that you have, opinions, same on your political podcasts, all you folks out there that are doing massive numbers of political podcasts during this election. Think about your words. Think about your language. Think about your conceptualization of who you're critiquing, how you want to put some down to lose, how you want to put others up to win, or some ideology up or some other ideology down. All of this divisiveness of you and your smartness and you may be very smart and well-informed in certain ways. I'm asking you to think about, okay, and we're talking about 
the political sphere, we're talking about politics, all of that. Maybe it's the more micro, maybe it's the more meso or the macro scale of the political sphere. They're all important, equally important, as far as I'm concerned, in this holistic integral approach, which Marianne, I think, also definitely uh, prefers. We have to think about what impact is that language having on our children? Now I'm gonna say particularly, this is my theory, and it's kind of a, it's a hypothetical experiment in a way to carry in your brain. So I'm asking you all to plug in this chip, voluntarily, of course, based on the reasonable assumption that what we say in the world matters. And when whatever sphere we say it in, it really means a lot when you're saying it on public media, on your own broadcast and or on the big media sites. It matters, just like the 9-11, what grand narratives were created matters. And the young people are listening to it, getting the messaging for it. So think about what I'm saying, is that politically, the world in this crisis condition, you may not and likely are not actually politically prepared, that means psychological, philosophically, and otherwise, to actually fully understand what's going on and to fully know the answers and the best answers. You may have directions of better answers. Yeah, fine. And think about that in your languaging when you're sharing. Because a 10-year-old, and here's my focus, Jared's daughter is 12, and she's close to that age that I care about a lot. And I don't care about it because it's you know, special. It just is an interesting point, the 10-year-old. And what is what I am saying now, right, about the world and the condition of politics, a leader, or wherever my criticism might be. Would I want a 10-year-old to hear that language? Marin Wilson, ask her. Does she think about saying on public media repetitively, we are at six inches from the edge? And then she goes into things like, you know, we're in very dark forces, but going on, there's fascism going on. She's not afraid to use that language. But again, think for a moment, not only about adults, Adults are not all of the world. They are not the foundation, actually, of the world. In many ways, the children and the youth are the foundation. They are certainly the new leading edge of growth coming up. And they are integrating all this massive knowledge and intelligence as best they can, and the, the untruths as well the distortions, the pathologies. They're attempting to negotiate it all. So I think of a 10-year-old, think of them trying to negotiate and ingest and digest and integrate all the knowledge and information. So what are you adding to it, folks? I don't care what your persuasion is in terms of political identities and worth of the sides that you take in terms of, you know, bipartisanship and so on. There's something deeper than racism, classism, and sexism, and to me it's adultism. It is that we think we have the right to dominate the discourse of the entire worldview of a particular area or the world, whatever, or a country, or a school system, right? or a daycare center, or whatever it is, or a home. You're not the foundation, adults. Criticism I made in my dissertation work in 2000, 2003, and I pointed out that adultism in combination with fearism, and that's the tendency to want to make others afraid, systematically, unconscious or conscious, Make them afraid in some way so that you as an adult can then control. And of course, adults, adults do that with each other, called fear mongering. 
We can do that with our children, etc. And you can hear in that example with Jared, he did not try to make his daughter afraid. She did anyway. She got it. And she, yeah, is she afraid? Yeah, even though he says her tone of voice was very neutral. She was kind of just matter of fact, the world's all going to blow up. So you can learn to do and back off from those processes of a toxic fearism and adultism. That's a choice we can make as adults. That's a choice we can make as political thinkers, theorists, speakers, writers, philosophers, educators. But we won't do any of that correction of this core toxicity of adultism, fearism, and Marion Williamson is not going to ask the question, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that because if a 10-year-old was sitting beside me listening to my lecture or right in the front row, would I have said the same thing? Or six inches from the cliff. Well, Marion Williamson, you have to actually care about that because what you just said was just published. Just like the pictures of the jets hitting the towers were just published never to be erased more or less from human history and worse to be reproduced umpteen umpteen times even taken out of context and used for other discourses that people create to want to move ahead their agendas build a case build a conspiracy theory whatever it might be you're building a presidency Again, I could be talking to any political leader right here. Doesn't have to be Marion. Not unique. At this level. Yeah, she is unique in the way she's come to frame things and the phenomenon around her that's framed her. Yes, that is unique. By far, I wouldn't be interested if it wasn't unique. I thought it was revolutionary. But it's not unique because it's every adult, every leader, particularly leaders because they have such massive channels of viewers, those they're influencing, and they carry that differential power of authority. You know that, folks. You know the impact of authority, an authoritative voice. And that 12-year-old voice in that story I opened with is also an authoritative voice of her own making to be respected. And when that 10-year-old, my idea of this imaginary experiment, is in the room with us as adults, I think that will be the registration of we are politically unable, disabled. We, we haven't been able to stop the massive crisis going on. That tells me you have a disability to manage your home, to manage your life, to manage the way you speak and think, etc. Manage your heart, your love, to manage fear that overcomes and can distort so much of that love. We are in a political disability condition. And you have to admit your disability to correct it. No one more perhaps knows this than Mary Williams and, and many others. But what you will not hear, and here's where I move into recommendations a little bit as I end the lecture, is you just don't hear the political pundits, the political leaders, the politicians, include them all, the commentators. You just don't hear them admit political disability on their own part when they're delivering a message. I'm admitting it. I admit I have all kinds of disability because I am part of adultism, fearism, classism, racism, sexism. I am part of a cycle of domination, violence. I am part of the culture of fear, matrix. But because I'm part of it doesn't mean I don't
don't have capacities to be also free of it in certain ways. And that's what critical thinking is. That's what a critical theory of political disability would be or, or of philosophy itself, of education itself. We have to be critically reflective of the impact we have in our thinking ways. Oh, right. So I'm not going to repeat all that, and I can see myself wanting to repeat. It's boring. But go back to the 10-year-old, put the 10-year-old in the room at least. You might think of other beings you might put in, or even God in the room while you speak and construct your arguments and your right ways that you think are the best. And, and, if, and you can see the easiest, simple example here is that I'm asking adults, be humble a little bit more. Being brave and courageous, great. Okay, sure, sure. Even being fearless. Okay, sure. Uh huh. But not just from your perspective. No, take in multiple perspectives. And I'm asking primarily in this concept of physical disability, political disability is what I meant, to admit that we need to have a different reference point of what impact would that have on a 10-year-old? Is that what you want a 10-year-old to hear from you as a citizen, as a fellow citizen? Never mind being a leader, president, or potential president in the room. You're not alone. You're not alone in those rooms. You're not alone with that mic in your hand on that stage. Don't just think of the adults. No. There's so much seepage. There's so much porosity of knowledge and information that goes right through into the child, child's world. Certainly teens world, youth world, that's easier to see. But now we know it's going right into the child. It's going into the nature and design of their cartoons, which even have a political message at times or advertisements. It doesn't matter. It's going to go and seep into everything. And uh, I like the idea of the sociologist, uh, Dr. Bowman, Sigmund Bowman, uh, you know, in 2007 came up and with this concept really important for a virologist to think about and for all people, really, because he's a sociologist, he's thinking not only the psychological dimensions of fear, but the sociological, political dimensions. You could carry that right up to the spiritual dimensions, if you will. A liquid fear, it's the term he was able to coin because he felt that's the kind of world we're in. We're in liquid modernity, where these knowledge discourses, cultural movements of power, knowledge, and fear are moving and circulating in an economy of attention grabbing, right? Convincing others, manipulating and manufacturing consent, Chomsky, on and on. Many ways to construct that view or argument of what's going on today. Okay, so I think you got um, a bit of my sense there. I uh, will and hopefully can have some conversations. And just to let you know, children care about all that. Why? Because they have a natural understanding of justice. And that comes from their ideas of what is fair, what is kind, uh, when is there bullying, when are, is there a righteous truce here for them? Do they have a place to stand? Are they equal? The youngest, youngest children, <laughs> right down to babies, have some sense of, of this kind of fairness uh, in their political mindscape and landscape all right so that that that's worth keeping in mind children are of the political sphere and marion williamson's policies um so i'm just going to update you she's got a really great website obviously uh like she did in 2020 you can go there http www.marion2024.com and she's got a policy on education, no doubt, and child policy, you know, for care of children. She talks a lot about it in her work. She's very concerned about if we do not take care and educate children. She says it's primary, and that's her mother kind of maternality uh, aspect to her politics. And I highly, highly support that. 
that it's really important to challenge the old pathological patriarchy leftovers of how to build a healthy society and sustainable. Uh, we've proved that those don't work and we need new interventions and the journal is very, very important. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Millison and other leaders who might be of that persuasion to bring in more of that understanding. So check out, but she's really concerned about ideological capture is one of the terms she uses when children aren't brought up, right, with good basic food, health, clothing, parenting, and so on, uh, supports, you know, and all the human service supports that they need. We call them people with more disadvantage than others. And there's a really great program I'm just recommending right now to, for Marianne to think about uh, in connection with her allies as she builds on this education and care policy for America. He's uh, just a really good program. I saw of uh, a university here teaming up with the BC government here where I live in the West Coast Island here and really saying that all children who have been in care with the government for some amount of time at any point in their life they can come back to the ministry now. They can come back and get a supportive document saying I was in care between whatever years they are and for also those who are in care right now. And you will get a tuition waiver at this university here on the island, Vancouver Island University. And that allows them to not have barriers of economic constraint and pressure. And they're putting hundreds, thousands of people through from who have been in care. And those, yes, are very vulnerable peoples would match in some ways the susceptibility that Marianne talks about. If you don't get really good education and care, you know, by the time you're eight, you're going to be very susceptible to ideological capture from forces like gangs, people imposing all kinds of narrow minded bubbles of knowledge and wanting to basically get you and your bodies and your mind on their team and their ideological fascist, racist, whatever it might be, agenda um, to fight the battles for their leaders of those kinds of groups. And uh, to have a much healthier society, we really have to be able to get our children to not be so susceptible to be good critical thinkers and evaluators and have a good set of values that will help resist, or at least they will maybe look at that knowledge and information and, and you know, possibly even admire particular kinds of heroes from those kinds of camps of ideological capture. But you don't have to join, right? I'm talking about the kind of cultic. But don't forget, our entire society is a culture. It's cultic. And so we're talking also about it from an educational philosophical perspective and political perspective with it, that you have to keep children able to be good critical thinkers, simple. Again, uh, if we're not careful in the language we use as adults, as children are growing up and we scare the shit out of them, basically, um, not even in intending to, sometimes intending to, because we think it's for the better of them, we are scaring ourselves to death is a title of a book that came out in 1997, Herbert Cole. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, here we are, we're stuck in this very self-abusive cycle of scaring ourselves to death in so many ways. Is there lots to be scared about? Well, you could say, yes, there is. But what do we mean by that? How do we manifest that scared of realities going on? And that's where, you know, particularly Marianne Williamson talking about moving from this deficit fear-based reality to a love-based, more abundant reality is a big part of her trajectory at the moral ethical level, philosophical level, and a political level of what she's trying to bring to politics in the political sphere. And she gets laughed at. So that's what I'm summarizing in the end. What are people kind of doing? Well, they do tend to make fun of her in that woo-woo or that crystal ball, or they'll use all kinds of language, new age, guru, spiritual guru, and you know we've got secularists now on the left so i'm listening to their podcast and some of them more or less a little supportive of marianne because she's at least left a biden uh, but 
a lot of them just cannot stand how she is just too far spiritual, basically, and too psychological, too interior, and they're much more materialist, they're much more grounded that way. And that doesn't mean grounded is always good. <laughs> and grounded has to be balanced. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as an integralist, you want to have a bit of both spiritual material moving in a good flow, not creating these ideologies of, uh-uh, forget it, X those off, we're going to be this. And I think that's what just really thinking that will not lead to a really uh, a holistic integral approach. Big story. Big arguments there big controversies and then we've got people on the right again many who think she's just way too leftist and then you've got some on the right that are kind of happy she's running because they they think it kind of makes fun of and they'll it, it's it's kind of a joke because she's going to fail so badly they predict in the election and it will just look bad for leftist period and so they're happy she's running and they'll actually support her to run so you've got these Kind of really huge kind of ideological, cultural, political war. Back to my point of we better be really humble about that. We can do our critical analysis. Go for it. Go for it, folks. But at the same time, think about are we also functioning on our political disability just like everyone else, right, in our analysis, in our smarts, <clears throat> in our podcasts, in our fan bases, you know, that we're building. So that's really my talk today, and I could go on and on about um, many things that are going on. Uh, you can check it out on the internet. Uh, things are stirred up in two weeks since she dropped her hat in. But I'm just going to end with uh, noting that there's two podcasters, not necessarily big ones, um, the biggies, um, but they're very interested in politics and the young people, which I always appreciate that they care enough. And this is this problem of, you know, bringing fear. And I would ask them and anyone to think about, would you say the same thing with a 10-year-old in the room with you that you care about? So one of them, John T., March 6th this year, said, I'm a Marianne Williamson supporter and will be, but one of Marianne Williamson's first hurdles that I see is, quote, from John, Gathering enough support to scare them, end of quote. Yeah, he wants to scare Biden and the DNC and the mainstream corporate Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. And the progressives, so-called, even within the Democratic Party. Scare them, you know, Marianne. That's one of your hurdles. See if you can scare them enough. Yeah. Shan, uh, I believe Sean or Shan, uh, March 16th, 2023, analyzing uh, what the White House press secretary recently said about Marianne is made a, definitely a new age type joke uh, in front of the press and in the public sphere um, about Marianne Williamson running and challenging Biden. <clears throat> Sean says, quote, they're scared of Marianne Williamson, end of quote. That's why they're doing it. So again, he's making a that a positive virtue that they're scared of Marianne Williamson by their acting out in the ways that they are in these kind of immature, you know, ways that they are. Now, do I think that they're fear-based? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't make that kind of comment and you certainly, if you're the White House press secretary and if you had children or were a niece, uh, uh, an aunt or uncle or whoever you might be to young people around you um, would you want to model that behavior of how you treat another person who is actually in a democracy just competing for the position of an authority position this could be at any level of government this could be within a school right this could be running for who's going to be on the board or the executive of the school newsletter in elementary. So again, adults, we're not thinking about what we're modeling so well. We're not thinking about this 10-year-old perspective of what they're hearing about the world and what that's going to mean about their future. And will they reach, like my friend's daughter at 12 years old, with 
kind of, you know, it's all going to blow up anyway. So what does that mean? Probably it means she's going to have a lot of struggle existentially. And not surprisingly, pretty much most people are, but most people won't admit it. All of that is part of we are not quite, we're in over our heads, as the Harvard psychologist Robert Keegan says in his great book, came out in the 90s, um, cognitively, we're just in over our head. And I'm basically saying politically, the way we think and act is we're in over our head. Philosophically, we're in over our head. And that's okay. We're just in this disability that we have to admit. And the disability isn't out there all over everybody else and not you. Yeah, you, you may have some skills and differences that are different, and maybe more, even more mature, more informed than others. That doesn't mean that we don't have a fundamental disability, because we do. Because you, you might notice that nobody has been able to solve the problems in the world. Generally, these big problems, these wicked problems that they're being labeled now by many theorists and things like that. Nobody is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Gandhi. You didn't solve all the problems. Martin Luther King, no, the greatest heroes, right? So it, this is the kind of responsible civic citizen, how we educate, how we do politics. I've said more than enough for today. Thanks very much for listening. Um, we'll look forward to your comments below. And uh, do check out my talk on philosophical disability. It will give much more careful framing. I didn't do that today of concept or my theory around disability and why it's so important to bring into other ways of thinking about politics or philosophy or education. Bye now.